a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a run. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expounding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into a, an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very profound. Expanding reality. Nice to be a boy. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this episode, I got to sit down with Peter Gorman. It was a true honor to get to sit down with this award-winning investigative journalist, uh, former editor of High Times Magazine. He, of course, wrote the Paramount article, Ayahuasca, uh, mind-bending drug of the Amazon back in 86 for High Times. Uh, guys, he's done some incredible stuff. He's uh, made one of the biggest movements for bringing ayahuasca out of the jungles in Peru and exposing it to Western culture societies. And he's done some wonderful work down in the jungles as well for those people. So uh, guys, this is a true honor. Uh, without any further ado, Mr. Peter Gorman. Well, this is all Peter Gorman's field work. And uh, I respect Peter Gorman. He's not a personal friend of mine because I haven't spent that much time with him. But he seems to know more about this than anybody else. He's the only white person to have any information firsthand about it. His account is that uh, these extremely uh, uncontacted people in the Amazon have a tree frog which exudes something on its belly and they take a a burning stick and burn a hole into the muscle of the upper arm just like you would take a cigarette and burn a hole into your arm and then they pack this hole with this material from the underbelly of this frog and then a spectacular trip result. All right, ladies and gentlemen, an extremely special episode today. We have the great and powerful Peter Gorman on the show. Uh, your accolades are insane. We're going to get into all of it. So first of all, how are we doing over there, Mr. Peter Gorman? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. My kid's got COVID. He's not doing so well. But the other kids seem to be doing well, and uh, the grandbabies seem to be doing fine. So cross my fingers for my oldest. Man, we just want everybody to be healthy and happy through all this nonsense, you know, through all this craziness. Yeah. Okay. Well, my friend, uh, like I said, your accolades are insane. Uh, we're going to get into it. You are uh, one of the people that have been a mentor for me on my personal journey of spiritual awakening. Um, your uh, book, of course, Ayahuasca and My Blood, one of the best reads ever on the subject. Terrence McKenna is quoted talking about you and your work with Sapo. Uh, you have just an incredible career. You're sharp as a whip. Uh, your interests are interesting, which is makes you even more fascinating. So let's get into it. Uh, how have you been doing, man? What have you been up to lately? Well, let's see. Since COVID hit, and I did two weeks in a hospital in uh, a year ago <clears throat> for uh, collapsed kidneys. And a uh, hilarious story. And I know I'm old guys, and people, old guys always tell stories about sickness. But I was down in Peru, and I had crews out, you know, in the jungle. I mean, I was the leader of the crew. So we, I was out in the jungle for a couple of weeks and then a couple of weeks more. And I was getting harder and harder to move until finally my team had to kind of pull me up off a motorcycle. I couldn't get up, you know. And then my associate, um, when we got back to the city of Iquitos at the end of two weeks, at the end of the second two-week trip, I said, Peter, we're going home today. He said, no, I got another week. He said, no, we're changing tickets, buy new tickets. I don't care how much money you got to spend. So we went home, and 20 hours later, I was in the ICU. And it turned out my kidney collapsed. And I, they weighed me in at 238. And 14 days later, they took water out of my body. I won't tell you how it's disgusting. And I weighed 178. What? 60 pounds of water in four days. Jesus. You know, my daughter bought me all new shirts because all my shirts had been stretched. And anyway, so how am I doing? I'm doing much better than that. Nice. You know, 
On the other hand, if you're really going to ask, and the reason I told that long story is just to warn you, don't start me talking. I'll tell everything I know. Don't start me talking. I tell everything I know. Somebody got to testify. Somebody got to go. Just a warning. Mm, I love it. And this is always welcomed. So please bring as much of that sweetness as you can, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, so okay. you, of course, were the former editor of High Times Magazine. I mean, you've done so much in the work of uh, ayahuasca. So tell me about your first trip uh, down to uh, Peru, down in 84 there. Okay. I'm going to answer your first question first, which was, what am I doing now? Other than trying to recover from my most recent pneumonia last month or two months ago, <clears throat> um, I have a new book coming out in two weeks, uh, published by Gorman Bench Press. Uh, and the reason I call it Gorman Bench Press is because it's like getting it the fuck off my <laughs> fucking chest. I'll get it out of here. And, uh, and uh, I have a cookbook coming out in a couple of months. I put a deposit on an 84 foot beautiful wooden hull boat in the Amazon for January and February for a 50 day returning to the Avery River, the border of Brazil and Peru that I have been on three times, but twice with my own boat with a skeleton crew of three people plus me, where we got one time we got attacked by pirates and I married the girl who helped save me from them and uh, had babies with her and uh collected plants for shaman pharmaceutical and you know there's the terrific wild adventures in a a border where nobody nobody nobody's allowed to be um uh, except for bad guys and me and so i just i just put a deposit on this time i have a bigger crew and uh, uh but I, because we're doing some more plant collecting work but we're doing some other work as well um your own work three or four miles in to see what villages are around a bunch destructions going nobody's taking a tally of uh where the trees are being felled in a bad way out there you know but not right on the river but you know deep inside four or five miles inside so we got a drone specialist and we got a doctor with us because i've been sick uh and because we're so far away <laughs> there's no phone service nothing so uh and then I'm just finishing a musical, a which musical. is going to sound ridiculous. When I was a kid, my father was a Broadway actor, and my mother was a radio actress, and she had her own show. And her own show, I forget what it was called because I wasn't even born yet, uh, but she was credited with coming up with the these Dems and Doves of the Brooklyn accent. Huh. So a lot of what you consider the Brooklyn accent, like in a mob accent, comes from my mom. So when people say go for her, that's all your mom. I, I don't know about that, but when they say these 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 regs are no good, that's my mom. Those regs stink. That's my mom. These damn dopes <laughs> was the, the tagline. So I grew up in the theater and uh, and I was always writing. And so when I was a youngster, starting in high school, um, I wrote plays. And I had several produced off of Broadway when I was a kid. And then I had one disastrous one, which I thought was brilliant, uh, produced at Lincoln Center Library in New York City. And the audience really hated it. And I just got walloped emotionally. So I switched to short story writing <laughs> and then became a journalist and then became an investigative journalist, which was fine. A great evolution uh, in between being a cab driver and a cook and then a chef. But it was a great evolution. But somewhere in me, there's been this 50 year nag of, do you have the guts, Corman? Do you have the guts? Mr. Amazon, don't mind getting bit by anacondas, but you're afraid to run a show. <laughs> and there's been a certain amount of terror. And so I'm writing a show, and it's about, it includes South America a lot. And people, people visiting Peru who need things, who maybe sometimes discover they get much more than they anticipated. Um, 
and uh, the music is brilliant. So far, it's brilliant. Uh, my friend Matt Haddock, and uh, we 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 staged a reading. I mean, we paid for it, uh, and now we just got a grant um, to do a. We did a just a, a cold reading where people just got the script and we read it. You know what I mean? They read it. This time we're gonna the grant will cover like two weeks of paying the actors, so that we can get them into rehearsal a little bit and and you know get a flow going. So we'll have more of a presentation that you could give a producer. Um, anyway, that's what I'm doing now. Now, my first story, my first time in the jungle was uh, the woman I live with um, saw that I love the rainforest of India, the Kerala rainforest, half denuded, but really, really love Mexico and Guatemala, you know, down in the south of Mexico. And I was so enraptured that she knew I was headed for the Amazon. <clears throat> Pardon me. And in an effort to get me not to go, she found a book written in 1923 by a fellow named Fritz Updegraff. It was called Head Under the Amazon. And it was about a, a guy who went to school up at uh, SUNY State University at Buffalo. And one of his classmates was an Ecuadorian and the Ecuadorian, and he got along famously, and the Ecuadorian said, why don't you take summer at my place down in Ecuador? But it turned out his father was mining gold up in the mountains, and there was an indigenous revolt, and there was no way to get out of the mountains down to the coast where the river, you know, where the, where the ocean was. So they ended up having to run away through going the back roads through the jungle. And they ended up on the Yavari, which is the border between Brazil and Peru. And it was such, it was one of those, you know, turn of the century books, like I did the cowboy books when you read them, where every page is a new chapter, you know. When Bill sees Bob, you know, boom, 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 next chapter, next chapter. So, but it, it was page turn. And it gave me, okay, I've got to go to the Yavari. You know, I've never read any place as wild as this. And it really gave me a point of, uh, a jump off point. But the only place to get to the Avari was to go to Iquitos, Peru, which is the largest city in the world with no roads going in or out. And um, basically you take, you know, either come in by boat or airplane. Um, you can hike over the mountains if you want. And then, you know, I mean, there's a road that runs 80 miles to nowhere. But, you, you know, if you want to hike out of the mountains and to nowhere, you can end up on this road that, you know, I mean, but it doesn't go out of the mountains. It doesn't go any, you know, it doesn't go to the coast. Right? And, um, and it itself is a charming, crazy, molting bird constantly, you know, changing its feathers, but retaining its own self sense of self um, and so the first time uh, I was with two friends we traveled around Peru all, you know we did three months maybe well, you know a couple of weeks here a week there we got to Iquitos and we ended up hopping a boat to a town called Ricano which was about with the boat we were on probably 36 hours and I thought we can go we'll meet somebody that will take us to the joint nobody would they were terrified of a particular type of indigenous. Uh, they wouldn't go into the jungle. They would only go to the edge uh, where their fields were. And, uh, and when we ended up, when we turned, there was a guide who said he'd invited us to come with him. And I said, no, initially. And then he, when he, we came back, he showed up at the hotel and said, now would you like to see the jungle? He said, we just did 10, 11 days over in Ricana. He said, you didn't see the jungle. <laughs> Nobody took you to the jungle. I'll take you to the jungle. And so we went out with him for a few days. And during that time, we drank ayahuasca. <clears throat> and he was so amazing in the jungle. He was like anybody you've seen. If you know somebody who's a New York City cab driver, who's just wonderful at it. Or, you know, anybody, who, whatever they do, somebody plays a guitar like, I never played a guitar like that. Holy mackerel. You know, I'd already lived in Maine for three or four months trying to build a cabin. I'd already hitchhiked 50,000 miles. 
I had walked half the Appalachian Trail. I thought I knew this stuff. This guy in three days showed me I didn't know anything about, you know, how to deal with this. So the following year, I went out with him. And I mean, I just fell in love with him. And I had done the ayahuasca and I fell in love with that, even though I'd never heard of it before. And we ended up uh, doing 30 days jungle survival training, just him and me, where he took me to the middle of nowhere. I mean, we, we went to a place, we met an old Cornadero, because the Cornadero I drank with initially was no longer there, it moved. And so we drank with a fellow who later became my teacher, Julio Arena, and um, then we took a, you know, a canoe two or three days up the river, and then we walked three days into the jungle. And on the first night in town, where Julio lived, he lived on the edge of town, but a town of 12 houses. Moses had me go out in a canoe late at night. I don't tell this story very often, I don't think. So you're getting pretty good fresh stuff. He sent me out with a fellow to take take canoe ride at night just to get the jungle in my blood, you know, to get the river in my blood. But during the course of the night, the fellow killed a caiman, six foot long crocodilian. He shot a monkey. And then he shot and wounded Nasslot. And I came back to camp and I said, cancel this fucking trip. I did not fucking come here to kill fucking animals, you fuckhead. I did not come here for this. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Moses was like, oh, you know, whatever he said, it just went, I didn't care. I didn't like it. So I didn't care. And, um, then we take the trip and we've got this food with us. And we've got bread and we've got potatoes. We've got tins of coffee. And during the two day hike or three day hike from the river into where we found what they call a cold bay, it's a depressed area in the land that retains water and salt because it's heavy clay more than the rest of the forest. So when the water goes down, the animals retreat from the river and they hang around the cold bay. So it's a great place to view animals, see animals and, 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 and fruit trees grow there year round. So it's good food to eat. And, uh, uh, we, we get to where we're going and Moise says, okay, now the first thing we're going to do is you're going to have to build three kinds of shelters, you know, an emergency rain shelter where the rain is coming down so hard, you're really going to ruin everything. And then a second kind of shelter, like an overnight shelter. And then a third one where you're going to stay somewhere for a week. <clears throat> it's all right. And we get, I get a fire going, ready to cook dinner. And Moy's like, oh, uh, what are you looking for? I said, well, we had beans and I was going to cook some beans. Oh, oh, no, I lost those. Well, we had coffee. No, I lost the coffee. Well, we had sugar. No, I lost the sugar. We had free. I lost it. We had nothing. He had thrown away all the food. And then he went out and shot himself a monkey and cooked it. And I wouldn't eat it. I said, I didn't come here for this. You fuck, I really didn't come here for this. And the next day, I was, I'd put up my uh, hammock slightly, the netting over my hammock slightly wrong. And so I was bitten a million times by white ants and my arm swollen like they looked like footballs. And uh, it was really horrible and painful. And there's Moises eating a bird. And I wouldn't eat. And then he collected a few leaves for me and dipped them in warm water. And then, you know, that's your dinner, that's your lunch, that's your breakfast. And, uh, on the fourth morning, I woke up and there were three birds. There was, I think it was two macaws and a parrot on a spit over a very low fire. And I looked at those motherfuckers and I waited about two hours. And I finally went over. I pulled one of the fucking birds off and just jumped it. And Moises, like a cartoon, comes out from behind a tree. and says, <laughs> that's the first good, right thing you've ever done in the jungle. <laughs> you got to steal food, steal it. But you have to have food. And that cured me of the, I'm not here to kill animals. I'm still not here to kill animals. But he made his point. This is a harsh place. You don't always have beans or coffee. And if you don't, 
you you better know how to collect a lot of leaves or hunt a monkey. Yeah, and nature will provide that. You know, that's all around in the jungle, and that's what they know is how to survive out there. Yeah. That's yeah. wild, man. So when you went on the boat ride and he was killing the caiman on the ocelot, did and did he just kill him and then leave him, or did he kill him and gather him? No, no, no. We brought him back. To, we brought him back to the village. Oh, okay. Yeah, we yeah, all yeah. were eating. Yeah, yes. I don't know. So see, it's all purposeful. Uh, what it's we like, couldn't find was the ocelot. Oh, the ocelot ran off. So you know, and he he got out, Alberto, and he remains a friend of mine. You know, low these forty years later, um, I don't see him that often. He's kind of a thief, so he always has to move around. Uh, yeah. He's getting caught stealing everything. Uh, but otherwise, he's a great guy with a great singing voice. Feels like he's coming up from the center of the earth, his sad songs. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> hilariously, one of his kids is a thief, too. And we were having a party in the jungle. I don't know, maybe seven, eight years ago. And Alberto at that time lived like two houses up from where we were. And we were, in the, you know, two miles up from the nearest house. So there's only these two houses in the neighborhood. But we sent word up, down, up and down the river, like, we're going to have a party. Food's free. Everything's free. Everything's free. It was my way of saying thank you to the people, uh, you know, who let us be on the river and without bothering us. Well, his son came. His son got ripped roaring drunk, you know, and um, and then he stole our pecky pecky, our boat. But he left his boat and he had taken off his boots and put them on our boat to keep them from getting wet. <laughs> and the same with his jacket, in which he had put all these little gold like um, buttons to spell his name out. He bedazzled you know, so, it. No, so we, we went up to his dad's and just said, here's your fucking boat. Give us the goddamn boat back, you know. And <laughs> Anyway, that's, that's theft in the jungle. It's not really organized. It's not a big deal. It's like, I don't know, that's why you're stinking boat. Uh, yeah. He's, he's like, all right, you got me here. It's, but it's over there, you know. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> you're like, all right, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> That's amazing, man. You just got so many fascinating stories. Like I said, I've, I've poured over your work for quite a while. I've seen a bunch of interviews that you've done, a bunch of talks. Of course, the the movie More Joy, Less Pain. We have a mutual friend in that, Mike McCoy, that made that, uh, featuring you, of course. Uh, him going down to Peru with you is a great documentary, man. He did a wonderful job on that. And that was a wonderful peek into what it's like. It was really interesting. Good. Now, the thing is, I did not... Mike McCoy spent maybe three, four years making that. Yeah. <clears throat> He'd come out of the jungle with me, and he had a, um, a, a camera phone, and he had an extension, whatever you call that, because I don't have a camera phone or an extension. Uh, and he could, like, hold it up if there was a crowd of people and still shoot his tall guy and see what was going on in the center of that circle. And I, he was just filming. And then we became friends, and he lived close by, and so he would come over. And he worked in my neighborhood. So he came over once or twice a week and he would film us having a food fight in the kitchen. He would film with my kids. He would film us making dinner or he would just feel me sloppy drunk. You know, he would just film us all the time. And it was, it was more than two years into it before he told me he was actually trying to make a film. So I had no idea. I thought he was just like, somebody who walked around filming everything in his life. Yeah. And there are people like that. Yeah, there are. You know, he told like, oh, by the way, here's a, now, I, 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 your clients, your listeners are probably going to be mad. Like, what about the story when Peter met the mod says, well, it's a great story, except that I've told it 300 times. Yeah. And I'll tell it if I, I will, but yeah, these other things telling you about the robbery of the canoe, is is I've never told that I don't think so. I'm trying to give you a couple of anyway fresh glimpses into the jungle. I like that because I haven't heard that story before. No, so that's wonderful. Yeah, and we had uh, oh yeah, Michael called his film "More Joy, Less Pain." He never let me explain it in the film, and I begged him "More Joy, Less Pain." My, I fell in love with a woman who was my cook. 
when the pirates came on the first boat trip the ride they made 39 footer traveling 2,000 miles almost 2,800 kilometers from Iquitos all the way down to Leticia up the Avari up the Galvez and then back and I had a one driver, one motorist, one cook, and me. That's it. I mean, I was the guy who stood at the helm all day long. And then the other guy took over about six at night when it started to get dark in my eyes. The jungle shadows are very weird. You always think like, oh, my God, I'm going to hit the coast. I'm going to hit the, you know, the uh, riverbank. No, you're not. You're 50 feet out, but the tree shadows are, you know, throw you off. <clears throat> at least they threw me off. He would drive till midnight, then we park the boat, we grab a tree, park the boat, put some grease down where you enter the boat and put grease down on the rope that we used to log, you know, to tie on the tree. The grease on the tree, on the rope, kept snakes from being able to come in. And the grease on the boarding step kept caiman from being able to come in because that river is full of black caiman. They're very aggressive. So you'd hear the As they were slapping to try to grab on, but they couldn't because you were putting, you know, old motor grease is very important in the jungle. You never throw it away. You know, you have to go buy it. Like, you want to protect a house that you're building from termites and bugs and all that? You got to soak that stuff in old grease. Jeez. I mean, you got to coat it and coat it and coat it and coat it or else ah, the animal, the bugs will get it in three months, six months. Beautiful house goes down the drain. Jeez. Anyway, um, we had the most wonderful marriage and she came back to New York and we went down there and it took me about a year to get her two boys out and uh, get them adopted and, you know, all that stuff. And um, then it started to go south. So I moved us all back to Peru. I bought a house, a small house in the city. And, uh, I, you know, it started to go south. I was just drinking too much. I wasn't hidden. I wasn't. I was just yelling all the time. I was just boring. So we were breaking up. And, you know, let's put it this way. She broke up. I was broken hearted. Okay, so there was a breakup there, but there were two different kind of breaks. Um, she broke free. I broke heart. And then um, uh, we had very acrimonious couple of years. I was very mad at her, uh, uh, and he, he alternately beg and scream, and she would make a point of trying to kill me um, in the way some people can, like, whatever, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it, oh, I was at my apartment, but the lights don't work, so I have to get made up for a date at your house. Right. <laughs> whatever. You know? <laughs> then the clothes go right out the freaking window, mm -hmm. you know, and and then the cops come because you stole her clothes. You're like, no, she didn't, I didn't get permission. To go. Anyway, that's the kind of acrimony that goes on. It still wasn't up anybody. It was just like the, the strong as the love was, the anger was as powerful. And, um, you know, ayahuasca teaches a lot to idiots like me. And one day I was in bed. And we were at our probably worst ever. And um, she had done, although she probably won't even remember it, she had done that thing with her clothes and the date and making it up in my house. And by that time, her mother, who was dying of cancer, was living with us. So she felt the right to come and go in my house, even though we were, you know, separated. And she asked me, Peter, can you go get me the... Uh, special underwear I bought from whatever the, one of the sexy places. So it was like crotchless underwear. And I, I went insane. I just, you know, tore it up and threw, you know, probably set it on fire in a bathroom. It's like, you know, yeah, I, I couldn't handle it. I just couldn't handle it. Okay. And, um, so I was lying in bed and I woke up with a start because ayahuasca had just whispered more joy, less Pain. It's like, what the fuck does that I mean? I was ayahuasca, but it was like, what does that mean? I'm not on ayahuasca, but it means it's in my blood because I do it often enough. What does that mean? And I realized 
It took maybe three days. And it hit me like a lightning bolt. You have the right and the possibility of creating more joy, which will produce less pain, or more pain, which will produce less joy. And so here you are, sorry. Your people saw me cry. I'll deny it. I'll deny it. I'm just watering. Uh, yeah, because it's very sad, you yeah, know. The the passion. I mean, it's understandable, of course. You can tell. I mean, this hits you. And I had to choose more joy because choosing more joy meant the kids would hear us squabble less. They wouldn't be terrified. They wouldn't be choosing sides. And so I just, it took weeks to really incorporate hundred <clears throat> percent. But I really, I made every effort that no matter what buttons were pushed, I just sat there and said, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, or, you know. And at some point later on, she asked me for crotchless panties that evidently she'd gone out and bought. And I said, you know what? And I brought her eight pair, ten pair that I had bought, all different colors. And I said, you know, I'm not sure what you're going for. I mean, if you're wearing a short blue shirt, I think these syllables are going to look fabulous. But if you're wearing a tiny, tiny red short shorts, I think, I mean, I think this green is going to just go right with it and surprise the piss out of that motherfucker when he pulls the pants off. And, you know, she, she, I mean, I was mean, but it was still more joy, less pain. And, um, and she went out, whatever she did, she got dressed, she went out and she came back 15 minutes later. She had no date. She was just making it up to kill me and that was the beginning of our both understanding we could we do have to keep doing this the hard way i get it you're not with me anymore you know what we had was been brilliant thanks for giving it to me. but right now our kids can start growing up normally again instead of every time they see mom and dad they know hide under the bed they're going to be screaming for half an hour you know yeah. So, but Michael wouldn't let me explain that story, which I really wanted to to say in the movie or give it a short version. I I'm grateful that you shared that story. I mean, I know that Michael didn't give you the opportunity to, but maybe you just saved it for our audience here because that is a piece of you that not a lot of people get to see. But it's very real, and this is one of the hardest part about relationships, man. No matter what happens in them. When they end, no matter what, usually there's a lot of animosity, unfortunately. There's a lot of pride involved. There's a lot of, um, you know, wanting to hurt the other person because you feel – there's an old saying Neil Donald Walsh has that, you know, what makes you want to hurt – what hurts you so badly that you feel like you need to hurt me to heal it, right? And this seems like one of the things that happens in a relationship at the end there, but it seems like – I mean, you you transcended it and you did it for the right reasons, for your children and for your joy. And and then it, it really changed the energy in the room right away when you walked in with that perceivably smart ass remark. But it was actually incredibly brilliantly crafted psychologically because it shifted everything and it was unexpected. Right. And then 15 minutes later, she's back. It's a uh, it's an interesting. Well, uh, you know, I, mean, I was so I don't think she'd ever had any dates. I think the right, whole of them were made right. up. And just it's went out and went out with her sisters because she got three sisters here and they went out and got a couple of drinks and you know looked sexy in the bars and then came back or went, went back to their homes I, if she didn't it didn't it wasn't my business but the fact is it wasn't my business and so i but it was also important that it was when we get into the worlds where the bales are lowered between the realms. And I don't want to get hot and crazy. And I certainly don't want to get spiritual or, you know, fake, fake on this. In my world, the way I had to explain it to myself, when I like associated with a bird or a crocodile or a snake, and felt the muscles moving. I mean, and I don't have those muscles. So it was like, holy, holy, holy moly, moly. So how does this happen? I know this is not LSD. Yes, with LSD, LSD showed me that the walls 
breathe, you know, and, and, and when I get in the zone writing, man, the, the walls are breathing. I mean, there's everything around me, you know, and I realized with ayahuasca, it was changing my vibration just a little or maybe a lot, but changing it temporarily. And I try to, what does that mean? How do I explain that to people? I'm a writer. I'm supposed to explain that. And then, uh, nice light bulb over my head. Thank you, baby Jesus. Uh, it occurred to me, let's talk about a dog whistle. If I blow a dog whistle as loud as I can right now, you won't hear a thing. That cat over here won't hear a thing. The chickens in the backyard won't hear a thing. My daughter won't even know I did it. The three dogs will jump off the floor 12 feet if they hear a screeching dog whistle. So, it doesn't mean the dog whistle didn't exist. Because the dogs are proof it did exist. It's just that my broadband wasn't quite broad enough to pick it up. So, what if I could change my vibrations a little bit to the point where my broadband was big enough? Then I might not just hear the dog whistle. I might see all the other spirits that are living here in my space or I mean, their space, whatever. I mean, we're in whatever we are sharing. I might see that this desk was a tree 100 years ago. And when it was a tree, it was full of life and full of stories and had friends. Of, I'm not sure how. And it certainly doesn't talk with a human voice, but it doesn't mean it doesn't communicate. So maybe I can communicate with the spirit of this tree. And so to me, the dog whistle example allowed me to just see all of this is real. All of this is not just possible. But in, in, and once ayahuasca was in my blood, uh, and it doesn't matter the quantity of times, it matters the quality of the friendship. You know, there's some friends, if you don't see him in a month, you forget their name. There's other friends, you don't see him in 20 years, and you meet him, and you finish the conversation you were having, you know? I just had one stay here this weekend, yeah. Same thing. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. So, the idea that I would wake up with the words reverberating in my head, more joy, less pain. And that's not the only thing, but I'm just saying that was the plainest example. You know, it, it, on the one hand, it blew my mind. On the other hand, it was very, yeah, you're in that moment. The veil got thinner and you need to be able to change the vibration. And while you were sleeping, you did. And you, you know, heard what was important to hear. And that was, you know, I mean, I know it was just a relationship story, but still, it also is an ayahuasca story. It also explains why I think it's good medicine, you know, because I think it really does allow you to hear that dog whistle or to see those spirits. And one of the things that was um, reminded of whenever you tell, tell us about the animals and how you could feel muscles that uh, you, when you could feel the snake, but you felt muscles of the snake that you don't possess. I'm reminded of the story of that you told about Julio when you were out there, I think your second time down to Peru when you got ayahuasca, got medicine from him and he just said, Oh, it's ayahuasca. It's going to help you. What does it be better for the jungle? Was that his quote? No, that was Moises was the one who said. Was it Moises? I had. Well, Moises told me to give, gave me Julio's medicine. Okay. That's Moises what it said was. to drink Julio's. Yeah. And when you were walking around and you saw, you felt a bird and that bird went down, got a fish, cut it in half and was eating half of the fish and you choked. Like you could feel like you were choking. Yeah. That's how connected to that animal you were in that moment. Oh, absolutely. No. So this, this is an interesting. I had no idea. I had no idea that every feather had its own muscle. Yeah. And it, it didn't this... move like 20 feathers at once. It moved one by one by one. Yep. Yep. You know? Jesus. And this is yeah. what's interesting about that this. That was the first experience. Yeah. And, and this is why whenever you talk about uh, the people in, in 
in the Amazon, whenever they talk about the medicines and people say, how did you figure this combination out? They say, well, the plants told us, you know, it's very matter of fact. They're just like, oh yeah, they told us how to do it. So it's this connection to spirit, to life, to everything around. And you know, there's correlations to what you talked about, about physically experiencing a choking uh, through this observation of a bird in that state or connected in that vibration is how we'll, I would just phrase it. But people also do this with uh, hypnosis. It's almost like it hits the same vibrational frequency. The other connection to that level of existence or that access of consciousness that we get in this life through different means is the abduction phenomena, UFO abduction phenomena. People have to be regressed into that state to recall it. So it seems like that that's where a default hard drive or access to everything, to the ethereal, the Akashic records, if you want to put it that way. It just seems like this is a way to access it, but it's all kind of a similar thing. Because back to the hypnosis thing, um, sometimes people will describe past life memories under hypnosis in that state where they're drowning, and then they start drowning on the table, you know, on the couch. And yeah. so they get this visceral physical reaction from just associating associating with that time of consciousness and you can do this with animals and birds on that level in that frequency that's how powerful this stuff is yeah and i really do think it comes down to a simple change the vibration if my vibrations are going at one two three and suddenly my vibrations are going like one two three one two three one two three hey i mean listen to somebody playing a piano it's a different song you know, you, you play a slow blues song, and the next guy is playing a New Orleans jazz song. Holy mackerel. It's completely different mood, completely different perception of the whole world by simply going to a rock concert and seeing a band that knows how to change things up, to pull you along, to push you down, tell you that's enough. Whoa, slow down for me. You know, and some of them were great like the old blues product would be like take a little bit lower now take a little bit lower and until they got you going so slow and when he got you absolutely almost comatose on the ground because you always smoked dope you know then al cooper would scream you know take a little bit louder now <laughs> everybody would jump off their freaking seats at the cafe logo so but, but you know and i mean that's but that, that's also an example you know there was a million examples of it i found it it got most clear for me with ayahuasca, you know, and then for somebody else, it will, yes, it would be breathing work or it would be hypnosis or it would be acupuncture or, you know, all sorts of things that can allow you to change the vibration, to catch a glimpse of other things that are here and other spirits that are here, you know. I mean, I'm so glad that they're saying, yes, trees do communicate. Oh, yeah, psilocybin communicates with itself all over the world. Oh, yeah. It's like, finally, finally, because the rest of us knew that. But we sort of felt like we're fools and we're not allowed to say it out loud because we get in trouble or sound like, like me with high times. You know, some of the stories people think, oh, he's nuts. He's a doper. You know, let's bring it up even now. 70 years old. Yeah, you're a doper. That's why your brain is crazy. See, it's ridiculous. And I've got a theory on this. I think that all of that is just like the matrix or a system in place, and it's all part of a big system uh, to be the opposite of what really resonates with, I'd say about 15% of us probably, yourself included, of course. But um, whenever, so let me ask you about this. Uh, do you, Why do you think that information that we can access is only accessible and not the default way of existence. Like, why don't? Why do you think this is something we have to pursue and seek out rather than just the way we experience things? I think I don't mean to be too quippy, but I think I, mean, I, I don't mean to be like too snap my finger. Is your answer? But I, but I have because I have thought about it a lot. I think that your basic survival here, a long time ago, your parents, 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 parents you living in mud huts. I think they knew this stuff. When someone says, you know, oh, we're not hunting today. Why not? I talked to the bird. Now, did they actually talk to the bird? Or did they see that the bird had tucked its wings in and its head in and was not flying that morning? Either way, the bird communicated and don't there's no animals are going to be out today baby 
Okay, so why bother hunting? But we forget that as we somehow we got it in our heads that that was poor and dirty. And we decided that we wanted to be sophisticated. And I don't know if this happened with some cultures it happened. It hasn't even happened yet. With some cultures it happened 800 years ago. Some cultures it happened 4,000 years ago, you know. But at the point where you decide to become sophisticated, at the point where you decide to wear shoes, and everybody ends up wearing shoes, and my mother-in-law used to, when I'd call her, you fucking Indian motherfucker, she'd get mad. She'd go, I'm not an Indian. My mother wore shoes, <laughs> which is an indigenous person's way of saying I'm a city slicker. I'm not, right. I'm not in the country. It's the mark of high society. Yeah. Sorry, boss. Sorry. <laughs> we ended up falling in love with each other. It just took us a couple of years to get over. But um, I, I don't know what else to say other than I think we all had it. I didn't personally have it. I don't know if you had it, maybe. But some of us were lucky enough, like my parents as actors, uh, in New York City to have a little magic in their fingertips, to be able to become a different person altogether, so that even if you called Madeleine, the Madeleine, Madeleine Gorman, if she was not Madeleine Gorman, if she was, you know, Rose Kelly from the Bronx, she didn't answer. She wasn't being a wise guy. She, when people are living here and people come here all the time, not during COVID, but traditionally there's three, four, five people a week in this house, some for a day, three days, five days, come by and hang out for a few days. They'll see me right in the morning and later they'll say, Peter, did you just ignore me? I did something wrong. I said, what, what are you talking about? Well, I mean, I offered you coffee. I, you know, I told you I was going to clean a garage and, you didn't, I, said, I had no idea. It was me and that. It was not me and you. It was a shut world, man. So, uh, so I'm lucky enough to glimpse that sometimes with my work when I get in the zone. But I think my parents had some of it. But I think it's it, the whole culture, Western culture. I know a little bit about Europe. I've traveled through Europe and this and that. But I mean, particularly a lot of the United States, and I've traveled a lot of the United States over the years, is makes an effort to forget that connection. It, may, it really works hard at saying there is no magic. There is no other life. There is no other level. There is no other, you know, and so, so we end up losing that and we raise our kids and we don't tell our kids they've got it we tell our kids stop it's an invisible friend that's not a real friend no there is no santa claus well, who the fuck cares somebody brought him presents you might as well call him santa claus we don't care if it's mom or dad just call him santa claus i mean why would you do that to somebody when there's something to be said for whimsy, you know, you want a little bit of whimsy in your life. But I think also these are very real things that people very that do definitely connect with. And I think you're right. I think it was a deliberate severance of that connection. I think that it was done on purpose to control people. I think there are many mechanisms in control over over time because like when the when the spanish came over and burned all the mayan codices i mean it's like they thought they were worshiping devils but there was a ton of wisdom and knowledge from those people in there just lost because of an ideology yeah it, it's odd the way that this happens and of course you know i mean um history is written by the victors so of course the spaniards would say that they were horrible devil people mayans couldn't defend themselves so they're you know they're just gone their history has gone uh, and then so that's the story that we're passed down and we're left to kind of discover this stuff on our own. Now, to something you said earlier about not getting too spiritual or hippy dippy, you, my friend, are in a safe place. And I'm going to tell you, I got 7%. I got 7% on the phone. That's all I got. All right. Well, so you we'll got wrap, five minutes. You got it. Okay. Well, I was but just going to say, you're you, you can go as spiritual as you want with this thing. So you can go as hippy dippy as you want. So let me ask you this. Out of all your travels, out of all the experience that you've had um, in this dimension and others, what do you think this is all about? Just the purpose of everything. What is your kind of idea about what's going on here? Sorry. 
Some people say a man is made out of mud. A strong man's made out of muscle and blood. Saying, be it on you call me. I can't go. I owe my soul to the company stuff. I haven't figured it out. I don't know. You know, I mean, I know part of it was for me. I don't know what it is over universally. I have no idea why we're here. I have no I, I can't fathom what's our purpose other than that we're future bug food and all the worms in the ground are looking and saying, my children are going to eat well when they get through that casket. I, I mean, to me, that seems reasonable. Although that's not the most delicious, you know, concept to come up with. Um, for me, part of it was just the exploration of the joy and then being able to share some of that joy to bring joy to other people because it's pretty cool. And part of it was to raise kids and just go through the good, the bad, and the ugly that comes with raising kids. Hopefully most of it was good. Um, and, uh, but I don't know. I don't know. If I, if I ran into St. Peter at the end of it, if there was a St. Peter, and he says, you know, three answers, one wrong one, and you're off the cliff into hell. You know, like a troll or something, you know what I mean? That's how I see St. Peter. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, that's spot on. Yeah. <clears throat> and he said, what was the meaning of life? The only thing I would say is to live it. I don't know. I have no idea. I get up every freaking day. I put my pants on. Today, my because I've been so sick, I'm trying to learn to walk again. But my kid was sick, so I had to get him a, a, one of my tubes of oxygen, which I've never used. So I got that done. And then I've got to take a water heater that's sitting on my front porch and put that in the, in the garage. I don't know if I'm strong enough to do that today. You know what? I'm doing it anyway. Then I'm going to mow a little lawn. I don't, that's my purpose in life today. And in between my purposes, maybe I told a couple of stories that a couple of, people, a couple of your people would say, Man, I wish I heard that first story about the mutt says and the kid and the monkey. And when he put the, they burned the live monkey and then the baby monkey went on a tit of a, a woman feeding her own baby. Okay, that's the short hamburger version of it. But, um, <laughs> sorry, read the, read the book. Um, <laughs> but that was also part of my job for today. You know, was to and hopefully maybe entertain somebody. And this morning I got two or three people who called and somebody wrote and they've got cancer and they're afraid they're going to die soon. I don't know. And they're like, well, what can I do for that? What medicines do you have for the jungle? And so I made them a package and I'll send them some medicines tomorrow. And if things go well, they'll get an extra six months. I ain't going to cure them. But the medicine such hair going, when you got them, I might give them six months per year get their affairs in order or to rethink a couple of things. And if they don't use them, they don't use them. And I, I don't know them. I wish them well. I wish they didn't hurt. So what, what was the purpose of life? I mean, that was your big question overall. What's the whole value or whatever. And to me, the answer is, I don't know. Today it was a couple of those letters that need to be answered, a package to be made up, talking to your folks, trying to walk a little bit. See if I got the balls to try to move that water heater since I don't have any balance right now and try not to fall while I'm doing it. Um, and then make a nice piece of fish for dinner for three of us tonight. And uh, that's the easy part. I was a chef. Dinner was great. Um, I'm sorry. Everybody hates people eating fish. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um <laughs> You know, and, and I don't know, I dealt with my ex-wife today. I I dealt long distance with my kid. Uh, I talked to a couple of my grandkids. I don't know, what was the purpose of life? Getting through till tonight. Mm. You know, opening a bottle of wine, have a couple of glasses of wine, call a couple of friends. You know, I mean, I got a rotation of, you know, 30, 40 people and you call one. You know, next month you call them again. You know what I mean? So it's in these days of COVID, it's important to have some human contact. Mm. 
No, that's nice. To me. Yeah, no, it's it's important for everybody, man. It's we've got to do that. Yeah, you got to stay connected. Well, if you need help with that water heater, you know I just live down the road. Just let me know. <laughs> uh, and um, so. I tell you what, I'm going to link all of the ways to find you uh, down in the show notes. Of course, please come back anytime. I have a bajillion more questions for you, uh, and I could just you, talk you to you. Just let forever. me know. I'm, I mean, I'm yours. It, it always seems hard when a person first gets in touch because I don't really have a schedule. Yeah, I don't know who's going to write me that morning. I don't know. Yesterday, for instance, I saw I, I what, Friday or yesterday, I put up the ad for my new book, the Magic, you know, Magic Mushrooms in Indie book. Because I need to make money before it goes on sale, so I can finish paying the, the editors, and uh, etc. And you know, suddenly I got twenty, thirty, forty sales, and I've got to spend three hours getting all that organized. Even though I haven't got a book in hand, but I still got the envelopes. Who wants signature? Who doesn't want a signature? All that stuff, and that will take that day. So it's hard the first time to connect with me. But now that you have, anytime you feel like. You got an hour to kill and you got an empty space. I'll probably have another song to sing. Awesome. I know you do because we have a billion things more to talk about, man, for sure. Uh, so I, I can't thank you enough, dude. This has been incredible. Um, of course, I'll link all the ways to find you down in the show notes, uh, your website, as well as your books. You guys go check it out. Uh, the absolute legend, Peter Gorman. Thank you so much for your time, brother. You you bet. And how do I... How do, how does my daughter or my friend get to see this? Oh, all Where do we go? I'll send you all the links and everything. And actually, uh, thank you for the plug. I usually do this in the outro, but we can do it now. Uh, expandingrealitypodcast.com. Uh, and then there's a YouTube version. So this will be up on YouTube as well. But I will personally send you all the links and ways to find this whenever it's released. Well, thank you very much. You're, you've been a gentleman and a terrific host. And I appreciate you letting me cut loose. And thank you for not making me repeat old stories. And I hope your listeners don't mind tinier stories but new ones or ones that I don't do a lot honestly I appreciate it we just kind of go with the flow here anyway and I just want you to be comfortable so by you telling me stories that I haven't heard um, has been incredible but of course whenever I link you've got clips and stuff and uh, from interviews that you've done that I've just poured over so people can go out and hear those other stories and I highly encourage them all to do so spend a little time guys get as familiar with Peter uh, as those in the know have and y'all just enjoy this man as much as the rest of us. Peter Gorman, thank you so much for your time, brother. Thank you. Bye-bye. An absolute true honor to be able to sit down with the great and powerful Peter Gorman. You guys check the show notes below. I will go ahead and link his ayahuasca in my blood. Of course, it is a paramount book. If you guys have any questions, that is your book. There's your resource right there. If this has been speaking to you or you came across this episode, it's not by accident. Uh, go check out the links below. I'll also link his brand new book, Magic Mushrooms in India and Other Magic Tales. Uh, it promises to be absolutely fascinating because it's freaking Peter Gorman, man. So uh, as for this show, guys, go down and uh, check the show notes for the link to the website, which is just expandingrealitypodcast.com. That is where links to all socials, all that good stuff for there, Patreon, YouTube, uh, all of it's over there, guys. Um, also down in the show notes is a link to Vinny the Saint. That is this awesome music that you're hearing underneath this this is the guy that made it so go check him out show him some love uh, go out into this magical world that we live in guys uh, this week and just pick up a piece of litter of course be nice to everybody that you come across buy a meal or a coffee or just hold a door open or do something nice uh, get out of the left hand lane of course don't be a pain in the ass uh, and above all and beyond anything y'all go out into this world this magical place in which we all exist together and y'all just be good to one another Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time.